It's an honor to be here um, and to, I guess, discuss issues in my city. There are so many people around the world that are curious about uh, Jerusalem. Uh, John Kerry is in town this week, and um, many people from around the world are following progress that he's making. To be very honest, not many people in Jerusalem are following uh, progress that he's making. I think there are practicalities on the ground that a lot of people kind of miss. Um, when it comes to Jerusalem and understanding actually what, uh, what the realities are. And the, uh, people talk about, uh, we've talked about a two-state solution for a very long time. The debates between a one-state and a two-state solution are at times very interesting. Tonight, um, I'm personally most interested in discussing uh, practicalities in, in the city itself. Um, and and it, it works for me. But since I arrived in Doha, a lot of of the discussions around Doha or how the city is expanding, what the traffic is like, um, and the new, the new buildings and, and urban development. And in a sense, when we discuss Jerusalem or we discuss Israel, Palestine, or the occupation, we don't use those terms. We don't use terms like unemployment or dropout rates or what the occupation actually means. Um, and today, I'd like to focus a little bit more on that so we understand a little bit more about what we're talking about. Um, in what is considered to be the capital of Palestine, or at least the future capital of Palestine. Um, it's very hard to pinpoint where to start to understand uh, the history in Jerusalem. Personally, I don't do biblical very well, so I won't go back very far, or at least not that far. Um, but stop a random Israeli or Palestinian on the street and begin a political discussion, which will most probably turn into a political argument, and maybe a fist fight at some point, um, it's hard to decide where to start because we'll be debating what went wrong in the 90s with Oslo or um, uh, the 90s or the, the Camp David faux pas and why Arafat said no. What happened in 1967 for Israelis when we begin a debate, we usually talk about a two-state solution, 1967 have a conversation with a Palestinian, we'll start a debate from 1948. What about the Palestinian Nakba, the, the catastrophe? Um, something that personally in schools, in the school that I grew up in, we don't, we don't teach. That's uh, um, practically an illegal topic to, to discuss in Israeli schools. Uh, a couple of years ago, our foreign minister, Lieberman, um, had passed a law in Knesset saying that any educational institution that would discuss or teach the Nakba would have its funding pulled from the, from the Ministry of Education. Um, so in a sense, Israelis don't know about the Nakba. Um, and besides that, beforehand, a lot was going on in Jerusalem. For me, it's easiest to begin a discussion for a second from about 100 years ago before there were Israelis or Palestinians in the area. There were Jews and Muslims and Christians living in Jerusalem, and mainly it was in the old city inside the walls. Um, and Jerusalem was right smack in the middle of the seven Palestinian cities. Um, if you took a drive down from uh, the Sea of Galilee, from Tiberias, you'd continue down south to Nazareth, and from Nazareth, um, I guess through Um el and Jenin, and Nablus, or, or Shechem, and from Shechem up the hilltops into Ramallah, and Ramallah is a, is a suburb of Jerusalem, and from Ramallah continue into El Quds. And uh, El Quds was, was in the middle. You continue down south from El Quds, you'd go down to, to Bethlehem, and from Bethlehem to El Khalil, um, Hebron, where the Ibrahimi Mosque is, and down to uh, Be'er Sheva. And, and Jerusalem is right smack in the middle, also connecting Jericho with the oldest trade route in the world, and, and Jaffa, the port to the Mediterranean. And Jerusalem wasn't just a spiritual or a religious uh, capital, it was also a, an economic capital in the area Business, business happened in Jerusalem. Um, and towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, they, the, the, Ottoman, uh, the Sultan started selling off lands outside of the old city, uh, mostly to pilgrims that were showing up. And what many Israelis and Palestinians don't realize today, that a lot of the lands outside, Jaffa Street, the main street, for example, in West Jerusalem, downtown Jerusalem, um, the business owners will go into the old city and pay their rent at the Greek Orthodox Church because they bought that piece of land um, about 100 years ago. And not only that piece of land, they're actually the second largest landowners in Jerusalem. They own about 40 45% of, of the city. 
They own the land that the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, is built on. Um, the Givat Ram Hebrew University campus, whole neighborhood, Rechavia neighborhood. Um, it's not just the Greek Orthodox Church, however, it's also uh, the municipality. Town Hall is built on land that's owned, um, it's called the Russian Compound. The city prison is also on that, uh, on that piece of land. Uh, and behind that, the National Public Radio is, is in buildings that are owned by the Ethiopian Church. And the Muslim Waqf had also bought up a lot of land back then. So it's not as black and white as Israeli or Palestinian. Um, and these are, these are top, these, I mean, this, is, this isn't a discussion that one would have normally inside Jerusalem. Mostly we're black and white, Israeli or Palestinian. Um, and this is, this is back then. And one, also when it comes to what I find very curious and I ask about a lot is, if 45% of the lands in Jerusalem are owned by the Greek Orthodox Church, um, which belongs to one of the only states in the European Union that doesn't entirely separate church and state, um, who are also the Achilles heel for the, for the Eurozone at the moment, what would happen if the Greek Orthodox Church decided to auction off their lands, say, for example, to Qatar? What would, I wonder what would happen in, in Jerusalem if, uh, if, that, if that took place. But those, that's a level of politics that I don't claim to understand. Um, moving on after World War II and the Ottoman Empire falling apart and the British Mandate beginning um, and the Balfour Declaration, 1917, 1918, the acknowledgement of, of, uh, of the Zionist movement, uh, which was born mainly in, in Europe, central, northern, eastern Europe, um, socialist values, the, the solution to the Jewish problem and to anti-Semitism was a Jewish state. They weren't quite clear on where it was going to be. They talked about Uganda, they talked about Argentina. At the beginning of the British Mandate, Lord Balfour, the foreign minister, had said, um, Palestine. At some point, somewhere in Palestine, the Jewish homeland uh, would, would, would manifest itself. Uh, vague enough to not exactly pinpoint where and when, and yet enough of a European acknowledgement to say this is where focus this is where the movement will focus its efforts. And the Zionist movement went ahead and set up um, what would slowly become uh, pillars of a, of a nation state. The Jewish National Fund was founded to uh, fundraise all over the world, especially up in the, in the Arab world, actually, uh, to buy up lands in Palestine. Uh, the Jewish Agency was founded to find young Jewish couples from around the world and help them uh, what we call make aliyah in Hebrew, ascend or immigrate to, to Palestine, um, and, and, and nation state pillars like, like uh, education or, or banks, workers' banks, unions, co-ops, and businesses were set up, and over the years and over the decades, uh, this became more than anything a demographic race. Uh, the Zionist movement understood from the get-go that, that the, uh, the point for them was to bring as many Jews as possible, as fast as possible, so when the time came to declare, it would probably be on as much land as possible. Um, so tension levels at this point began to rise. It, obviously towards, uh, and then in the midst of World War II, as Jews were fleeing um, Europe, burning Europe and fleeing the Holocaust and the camps, uh, many uh, arrived on the shores of Palestine in ships. Now, the British, uh, the Brits back then understood that their job uh, was to maintain a, a certain balance in, within the demographics. That was the game to play. And they had made sure that there was a limit to the amount of Jews that could come in. However, Jews coming in on ships, uh, refugees from Europe, uh, needed a place to stay. In some, many cases, they were turned away back to either back to Europe or to refugee camps in Cyprus. In other cases, Zionist militias um, were, were founded to help uh, these, the, the refugees off the ships. Once they were off the ships, and in Palestine, however, uh, these Zionist militias also, um, their job was to also find a place for these, for these new refugees to live and slowly founded new villages, new towns. Uh, the Zionist militias, in many cases, used, um, used terrorism to, to help themselves to different uh, areas. Uh, Zionist militias that, that blew up the, the British headquarters in the camp in the uh, King David Hotel 
uh, in the middle of Jerusalem killing 89 uh, people in one swift bombing. Uh, these, are, these are issues that we don't often discuss when we discuss terrorism. Um, but the, towards, um, towards the launch of, of Israel, this was also a very, a very important reality, a very important chapter not to skip. Um, and as tension levels rose uh, and the world had to figure out what to do, uh, not only with the Jews, but uh, after World War II, uh, a, lot of the world's, a lot of the world's maps were being uh, drawn up once more. India and Pakistan and Afghanistan, um, Africa, and of course the Middle East. Syria was going to be up in the north and Lebanon was over here. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan um, in 1947. The British mandate, however, washed its hands of the responsibility for Palestine, saying, uh, we're going to leave it up to the newly formed United Nations to figure out. And the United Nations sent a, uh, a committee, a commission, um, that launched the, what, we, what they called back then the partition plan. Now, follow demographics. It's always the key to the discussion. The, by and far, the, both the Jewish and Muslim and Christian communities living in Palestine for the, for, for the generations prior had said, you can't partition Palestine. Don't do it. Um, the Zionist movement, on the other hand, had been very clear and very successful lobbyists. They're still very successful lobbyists. Um, had said, you know, this is, this is the solution. You promised us a Jewish state. The solution is to partition the, and to create a two-state uh, situation. 50-50 is what the, the commission came up with. At the time, however, Jews were only maybe 25% of the demographic. And those Jews, the Zionist movement itself, with all the efforts of the JNF to fundraise and to purchase land, had only managed to acquire maybe somewhere between 8 and 15% of the land. It didn't make sense to the local Arab leadership, to the local Palestinian leadership, to split it up 50-50. I can also imagine that they were thinking, who are you white folk to come cut up our land? Um, so obviously tension levels were again at their peak. Uh, in, in 1947, November 29th, Israel was accepted to the General Assembly with this partition plan. Um, it's the official day uh, Israelis consider the beginning, the launch of, of the 1948 war. What Israelis, what I grew up uh, with as the War of Independence, and later on what I learned was also the, the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe. As far as Israelis are concerned, this was a two-year war. I think as far as Palestinians are concerned, the Nakba began um, mid-40s and lasted well into mid-50s. It's a period of time of mass displacement. Um, and reading back on the Zionist notes and Zionist leadership, um, the benchmark or the goal was to launch a Jewish state. Um, a, for a Jewish state, for a Jewish democracy uh, to take place, there would have to be a Jewish majority. Um, and the benchmark was an 80% majority. Uh, at that point in time, and what became Israel, there were around 850,000 Palestinians living um, that had been living there in villages and cities uh, for, for generations. By the end of the war, by 1949, um, and probably well into 1952, uh, there were about 50,000 Palestinians left. That's a major, major project of displacement. One that has uh, by and far been erased from, from at least our history books in Israel and, and, and a lot of the books in, in the West. Uh, not, not a period of time that's discussed very well. Instead, the way I, I was taught about it was a heroic war of independence where four um, Arab states in the, or four or five, including Iraq, uh, had attacked the, the young state of Israel, and Israel triumphant, uh, triumphantly won the war. Um, in Jerusalem, what that meant was, uh, this is the first time the terms East and West Jerusalem were introduced. The, the, there were about 2,000 Jews that lost their home in what became East Jerusalem. Uh, Jews, Yemenite Jews that had been there for a very long time, actually, that had come decades earlier to live in the old city, were rejected by Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews, and went to live with the Palestinians in the, in the village of Silwan outside. They were more accepting. They had darker skin and talked funny, I guess, to the Jews living in the old city, uh, and were much more 
uh, welcomed uh, in the Palestinian communities. These communities and others in the old city were, um, were displaced and moved to what became West Jerusalem to be uh, compensated uh, and, and resettled by the Israeli government. And about 30,000 Palestinians from uh, almost 40 different neighborhoods and villages in West Jerusalem were displaced into what became uh, Jordan and, uh, and to be resettled by UNRWA, by the new UN committees uh, that were set up to deal with the, with the refugees. This is when East and West was introduced. Jerusalem was never an East and West kind of city. It was always a mixed city where Jews and Muslims and, and Christians up until that moment were living side by side. Um, the Palestinians that were left inside Israel, the 20% that were left inside Israel, including uh, the, the area called the Triangle, Al Muthalath, just, um, just north of the West Bank, uh, uh, were an extra 90,000 Palestinians that had actually won the battles against the Israeli army but were handed over during the armistice uh, negotiations uh, by the, the, the King of Jordan to the, to the, uh, the Israeli generals. Um, making it about 140,000 Palestinians. These were 20% of the demographic of Israel and still remain to this day 20% of the demographic. They were left under military control until 1966. This is also new. This was news to me. I only learned this after my army service. Again, another chapter that's, that's uh, not discussed in our Israeli school books. Um, the neighborhoods, the abandoned Palestinian neighborhoods in Jerusalem became home to uh, Jewish immigrants that had come from Morocco, Arab immigrants from Morocco, from uh, Yemen, from Iraq, uh, Turkey, Egypt, uh, that were brought in the 1950s by the Ashkenazi Zionist movement, settled at first in uh, absorption camps, uh, shaved, DDT'd, and sent to, to hard labor jobs, and then uh, basically left to claim abandoned Palestinian homes in the, in the, in the Nakba neighborhoods, in the, what we call the ghost Palestinian neighborhoods. Um, and over the years had, had left, were left unkempt. Uh, these are the, also the homes of the, of the Israeli Black Panther movement that were active in the 70s because the Ashkenazi government had, uh, had, been, had, uh, had not taken care of development there, not, not education or community development nor uh, um, waste management or, or, or anything of the, of the sort. Um, 1967, Israel occupies the West Bank, uh, the Syrian Golan Heights, uh, the Sinai Peninsula swiftly, and very quickly is the, the, the new Israeli government is actually met with, a, with an enormous dilemma. And even Ben Gurion back there, the first uh, prime minister of, of Israel had said, give it back. Uh, this is, this is going to bite us where it hurts. The we won't be able to handle the demographics. I think the debates inside the Israeli Knesset were about um, we did what, it, what had to be done after the Holocaust. This now is not something we'll be able to fix. Um, and the more religious, more right-wing factions in the Israeli government had said, what do you mean give it back? Uh, if you'll imagine the, the atmosphere in Israel back then, I can imagine people were euphoric. They just won an amazing war and conquered a whole lot of land. Uh, but besides that, the West Bank itself is higher ground. Uh, militarily, strategically, it'd make more sense to, to hold on to it. The water resources are in the West Bank. Over half the holy places in the Bible are in the West Bank. And again, people were euphoric. What do you mean give it back? We're not about to give it back. We won the war. Um, and inside Knesset, they went back and forth and back and forth to determine what are we going to legally um, call these lands. And inside Israel, they went back and forth and back and forth so much that they decided to not decide. In Israel, they're, they're, they're considered the disputed territories as opposed to the, to the occupied territories. Um, and in the 70s, uh, moving illegally uh, moving civilian population onto, into the occupied territories. Um, and at first, even today, Israel will discuss or even consider some of the settlements illegal outposts. Even back then in the 70s, some of them were illegal outposts. And one wonders how bureaucratically Israel justifies the development of these outposts into, into the full-blown cities they are today. Um, in most cases, when it's an illegal outpost, what we're talking about is maybe three caravans of uh, some Jewish Zionist fanatic um, Israelis that, that set up uh, at the top of a hill um, and 
they're not going to get much services, they're not going to be acknowledged by the government, but since they're Israeli citizens, civilians, they deserve a minimum of, uh, of, of, of security. And, and so the IDF will send a platoon to guard them. In order for the platoon to do what it needs to do, they're probably going to pave a road so that, the, so that the army and the jeeps can make it there easily. Probably a road around the three caravans to be sure that they can patrol properly. Uh, a lighthouse, a lookout house, and, and that's going to need to be hooked up to electricity. And a latrine so that, it, so that there's a latrine. Um, once that's in place, there's basic infrastructure. It's really simple to add another three caravans. And once there's six caravans, somebody will open a corner store. And another six caravans, it's easy to, to, to bring over. Once there are already 12 caravans, somebody's going to open a nursery school, probably build some new villas next to it, um, supermarket, another group of villas and, uh, and, and uh, primary school, and, and so on and so forth, from, from embryo, from three caravans into the full-blown tens of thousands of, uh, of, of, of settlements in, a, in, in Maale Dumim or Ariel today, um, that's, that's what happened very quickly over the last four, almost, uh, yeah, four, over four decades. It grew quickly, and, and, and you of all people probably know what swift growth looks like, probably far better than I do. But it, 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 gets, it gets me thinking how things can actually be solved um, much more easily than, than, the, than we let on, if we're actually determined to, to resolve them. Um, in Jerusalem, what that meant was, uh, in the 70s, the economy had shifted, and, um, and the rules were drawn up such that it was very easy for Palestinian farmers uh, in the West Bank to find a job in Tel Aviv or in Jaffa, either farming or working in construction, and they would get paid more under the Israeli economy than they would under the Jordanian economy. And, and, um, and there was suddenly a demographic problem in, in Jerusalem itself. I don't know if you've been to the area. For those of you who have been, you'll know that of the two cities, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv is the better city. Um, there's a beach. Uh, the boys, the, the men and the women are much prettier than they are in Jerusalem. The beer tastes better. It's just a better city to live in. My buddies, my friends that I grew up with have all moved to Tel Aviv um, and are living happily ever after in that bubble uh, and are oblivious to what happens in Jerusalem. That was the case already in the 70s. Um, the other side of, uh, of what was going on was young Palestinian couples were coming from all over the West Bank to live in Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem, where the Palestinian neighborhoods were growing very, very quickly. The Israeli government understood that there was a demographic, that was a demographic problem. They had to make um, priorities clear very quickly, and two priorities were made. One um, was the uh, Israeli neighborhoods were to grow as much and as fast as possible, um, and new neighborhoods were built very quickly, mostly on uh, Palestinian farmlands. Gilo, Ramot, Pisgat, Ze'ev, Neve Yaakov, these are all Israeli settlements that are today each have over 45,000 residents living in them. Um, the other priority, and, and when, we were, sorry, when we were kids, we'd go out and we'd, we'd take a look at the lookout, and, and we'd count cranes on the, on the, on the horizon. Isra the, the, the Israeli side of town never stopped growing. New roads, new community centers, new schools, new strip malls. Um, at some point, I think there were more strip malls per capita in, uh, in West Jerusalem than any other city in the world. Um, that was a moment in time. Uh, the other priority that was made was the Palestinian neighborhoods were to be frozen, uh, stifled, if you will. No Palestinian growth whatsoever. No new Palestinian neighborhoods have been built since 1967. Um, you won't find that in black and white law in the Jerusalem Municipal website. What you will find is a demographic benchmark. Um, on the website, it says, clearly, Jerusalem is to maintain a 70% majority of Israelis in, in the city. I don't know of any other city that actually has a demographic benchmark to it. Jerusalem has one, and this was the way to, to maintain it. Right now, I think there are about 37.5% uh, Palestinians in Jerusalem, uh, with all the efforts to stifle growth. Uh, so Israel is not succeeding. 
in its mission. It, 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 this is why gears are, are shifting in policy constantly. Um, so this was happening in the 70s. And in the 80s, uh, young Palestinian couples that wanted to, to work and, and go shopping and go to school in Jerusalem didn't have a choice, uh, but they did what, uh, what many young couples do all over the world. Uh, they move out of the central business district to the suburbs, to Abu Dis in El Azariah, to Bethlehem in the south, to Ramallah in the north, and they come into work and it's just a 20 minute drive. It's really not serious. Um, and the roads were built in such a way, the road actually connects them from Ramallah to Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It's the organic natural, natural uh, um, uh, traffic, I guess, uh, that it has been for, for millennia. Um, and down Jericho Road to Abu Dis and El Azariah. So the suburbs grew very, very quickly. And if you come to visit Jerusalem, you'll notice that the center of town, the neighbor, the Palestinian neighborhoods in the center of town feel like a village. They feel suburban. Uh, they have not grown. The, the Salah Hadin, the central uh, road in East Jerusalem, is exactly a snapshot photo of what it was in, in the 60s. Um, and, uh, and in the 80s, as everybody was moving out, things suddenly became confusing in the 90s. Um, I guess what people, don't, what people don't follow very well is also the, the economics. And this is, for me, something that, uh, that, that, uh, that opened my eyes to what was actually, what is actually happening now. Uh, I'll backtrack for a second. Um, Israel uh, fights in the 1973 war um, that had to do with oil. It was an oil war. We in Israel studied it as if it revolved around, the, around us, but um, it turns out the, wall, the, the world doesn't revolve around Jerusalem anymore. People in Qatar don't really, uh, aren't really involved in, as much in Jerusalem as I'd like them to be. Um, by the end of the 70s, as, as Nixon and Kissinger were busy with uh, war elsewhere in Vietnam, they had... Uh, they had lowered the volume on the funding to Israel, and the Israeli economy actually collapsed in 1979. Israel introduced the shekel, um, but in 1982 also launched a war with, uh, with uh, Lebanon. And by 1985, the economy had crashed once again. Inflation reached a new peak. Um, and in 1985, actually, Shimon Peres uh, launched the new Israeli shekel. Um, the new Israeli shekel's condition, with help from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, the condition for this new economy was that the West Bank Palestinians and the, and the Gazans Palestinians uh, would, would use this new coin. The Jordanian dinar was pushed out, the Egyptian lira was pushed out of, of, of Gaza, and, uh, and in 1985, 86, the new Israeli shekel was pushed onto, onto these new economies. This is also a couple of decades after the 67 Intifada, a generation of, of, uh, of Palestinians were just graduating. The largest generation of educated Palestinians were graduating from El Dajah and Bir Zayt and El Quds universities. Um, and they were graduating into uh, an economy that couldn't handle, uh, they couldn't handle that generation. This was, you know, we, can, we can look around the world to find out what happens when a, when a generation of educated uh, youth uh, uh, become, find themselves unemployed in, a, in an economy they can't handle. And this was the backdrop for the first Intifada, for the first Palestinian uprising. What I remember uh, growing up in Israel as an angry mob of, uh, of, of, of Arabs throwing stones and Molotov cocktail bottles were in fact a bottom-up uh, coordinated uprising. And they were talking about uh, strikes and sit-ins and, and, and hunger strikes and they wouldn't buy Israeli milk, they wouldn't pay Israeli taxes. And this was coordinated for such a long time, this, this intifada lasted for three years. I watch Occupy Wall Street, inspired today, but they can only keep things running for about six months. And this was without Twitter and Facebook. Right? This was not a top-down political uprising, this was a bottom-up um, uh, uprising which was squashed in, 19, in 1889 when uh, Yitzhak Rabin, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, back then defense minister, coined the phrase, break their bones. He ordered the IDF and many young Palestinian men and uh, uh, boys were sent to hospitals or prisons. Yasser Arafat was chosen um, from Tunis, iconic revolutionary 
um, to form the Palestinian Authority around the, the, the PLO. Um, and, and their job at, at this point, when Secretary of State James Baker said, uh, stop the fighting or we'll stop the funding, sit down to the two-state peace uh, negotiations in Madrid, uh, Arafat's, Chairman Arafat's job was to, was to represent the Palestinian Authority at, at those negotiations. These led up to the 1993 Oslo Accords. This is around the time the first checkpoints were introduced to the area. Um, the, the suburbs of, of Ramallah, Jericho, um, a Abu Disa, Zaria, Bethlehem suddenly had to go through all these young couples, all these families that had moved to Jerusalem now had to go through an 18, 19 year old kid determining whether or not they can make it to work, go to the hospital, um, visit their parents, uh, go shopping. This, this is when obviously tension levels would take another, uh, another leap. Um, in, in Jerusalem in 1995, what many people don't realize is uh, Jerusalemites, Jerusalemite Palestinians have a different legal uh, status than, than other Palestinians. Palestinians who received citizenship in 1948 are still citizens. Um, as opposed to the Palestinians living in the West Bank, Jerusalemites are residents. It's kind of similar maybe to an American green card. It's limited bureaucratically more than anything else. There is no political representation. They cannot vote uh, for the Israeli prime minister or, or, or participate with the Palestinian Authority. The PA has no jurisdiction in Jerusalem. They can, however, vote for the Jerusalem mayor. Uh, since 67, though, uh, Palestinians have, have chosen to boycott that vote. Um, considering today Naftali Bennett, I don't know if, you, if Naftali Bennett is one of the more right-wing settler promoting uh, ministers in today's government, he now is the uh, minister for Jerusalem affairs. Anything that happens in Jerusalem has to go through him first. So I consider that boycott probably a relevant boycott to still make. Um, since uh, they are not politically represented, also residents, uh, if they leave Jerusalem for more than three years, they're not allowed back into town. And all of the people that had moved out to the suburbs at this point were going to have to deal with the new uh, Ministry of Interior decree that uh, was basically framed around the phrase, the center of life. The Israeli border police started midnight raids around the old city and the Holy Basin area. Um, a, that were determined to prove whether or not a Palestinian family was actually living inside Jerusalem or living 20 minute uh, walk away in the suburbs. Um, and these midnight raids involved barging into the living room, pouring the, uh, um, the, the living room, uh, anything in the closets, in, in the bedroom, out on the floor. This still happens to this day. Um, and interrogating, mostly, usually the father of the family, asking, where do you go to work? Do you go to work in Ramallah, or do you go to work in Al-Quds? Do your kids go to school in Abu Dis, or do they go to school in Al-Quds? Because if you work in Ramallah, and your kids go to school in Abu Dis, and, you're, and they can't find your underwear in this apartment inside Jerusalem, then obviously your center of life is not Jerusalem, and they lose the permit to live in town. Um, and this happened to thousands and thousands of Palestinian families um, that no longer have access, um, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian families that no longer have access to um, the largest Palestinian metropolitan area. Uh, so obviously tension levels again were at their peak when uh, towards the end of the 90s, thousands of families started moving back into town, into the Holy Basin, and you'd knock on the door of a, of a three bedroom apartment in the old city and there would be 45 people living in it because they didn't want to lose the right to be with family, to go to work, um, health care, the marketplace. This is what the old city was about. Um, and, and, and so tension levels were once again at their peak. Clinton noticed that uh, his precious Oslo Accords were going down the drain. Uh, called Chairman Arafat and Prime Minister Barak into Camp David. This is an important moment because most Israelis will quote this moment. Before going into Camp David, Ehud Barak gave the Israeli people the most um, clear message that Israelis ever received. Um, we're going to give them the most generous offer they can, they, 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 they're ever going to get. 90 or 95 percent of the occupied territories. If he doesn't take it, he's either a terrorist or he's crazy, but they don't want peace. Um, and this was the message going in. 
And Chairman Arafat turned him down, flat out, said no. Um, and Barak stepped back up to the podium and he said to Israelis, there's no partner for peace, there's no partner for peace, there's no partner for peace. Ever since then, pretty much Israel has stopped discussing a two-state solution internally. What you hear outside around the world when it comes to two-state solution and, chair, and, and carry and the, and the discussions that are happening now are not discussions that we have inside Israel. Inside Israel, Naftali Bennett's campaign, the Minister of Treasury, was how can we annex Judea and Samaria? What is going to have to take place for that to, to happen? Um, a few months later, Arik Sharon um, took a walk on the Temple Mount during the third Friday of Ramadan uh, with 100 or 150 IDF and border police soldiers. Uh, protests erupted all over the country. 16 kids were, were shot and killed up north in the Galilee. Um, and the second intifada began and all hell broke loose. Um, during this period, it was also the Bush War on Terror and Israel got away with whatever it wanted. Um, I, this is when I was in the army. This is when the, uh, the wall was constructed, um, basically unilaterally creating uh, the reality that, uh, that Ehud Barak had discussed back in Camp David, but what we never understood was what exactly were those 95%? What were the 5% that Israel still wants to hold on to? What we hear from Netanyahu is um, settlement blocks. We don't want to let go of the settlement blocks. We don't want to displace hundreds of thousands of people now. Um, what we don't understand is that Ariel, the settlement blocks, what was never drawn up, Ariel is maybe one of the larger settlements. For all other purposes, it's a suburb of Tel Aviv, red rooftops, uh, now a, an Israeli university, um, is strip malls. It also happens to sit right atop one of the largest water aquifers in the West Bank, leaving Israel in control of, or, or the Israeli water company, in control of over 70% of the water in the West Bank. The Jordan Valley, leaving Israel in control of the Jordan Valley, leaves Israel in control of the, um, the international borders. And Maale Domim and Gush Etzion leave Israel in control of, of uh, the largest Palestinian metropolitan city, the, 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 the center, the, the capital. Um, Arafat may have looked at this map and said, you're asking me after I've compromised 78% of historic Palestine to now say yes to a state without, um, without a capital, without water, without international borders, and without territorial continuity. And he said no. But what we heard in Israel was there's no partner for peace, there's no partner for peace. Um, the realities in Jerusalem today, in 2003, 2004, the wall was finally constructed around the central business district, which meant that all those suburbs, um, all the people living out in those suburbs can no longer make it to the center of town. Uh, the center of town has dried up. The students can't make it to university anymore. Uh, consumers can't make it to do business. Uh, the produce in the West Bank can't make it to the Palestinian markets of the old city. Over 5,000 businesses have shut down over the last decade alone in Jerusalem. Um, unemployment is never, is, is at its peak level. I think there's a 75% poverty rate in East Jerusalem, 85 amongst children. Um, and this is all, uh, uh, it, it, it all has to do with politics, but it, I think for me it's most interesting to discuss Jerusalem when it comes to development and city development. What is it going to take if, to discuss employment, freedom of movement? Um, and, and, and many people around the world still discuss our two-state solution or peace, dialogue, coexistence, where I feel we ought to be discussing human rights and justice, but also what is it going to take to um, to open Jerusalem and the central business district back up to the, to the Palestinian people um, and, and discuss actual segregation. And I, th I think at that point, maybe I can open up to questions. Is this the right time to do that? I can rant for a very long time. I'm much more interested in hearing maybe what you're curious about um, and, and see where I can fill in some gaps. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.